Okay. Hi everyone, um, thank you for joining. I'm so excited to be here. I really miss doing the classes since the summer. I'm really happy that the SEA puts this out and I think it's such a wonderful uh, time. Well, any day of the week is great to learn about Israel, but we're in the middle of the week, Wednesday, I think it's a nice way to start your morning. The title of, of the class is Weekly Inspiration from MCCL and I, I, I get inspired just learning about it and I'm really excited to be here and um, talk about a new topic that I've never spoken about before. Um, I don't know why there is not connected to my class, but I have to keep admitting people to the waiting room. I don't know why I thought I took that off. So if, if anyone noticed, no, I don't know how you would even notice that people are waiting. I would notice. Okay, whatever. Anyway, um, we're going to start. I'm going to share my screen with you. It's not critical to see the screen. If those of you are driving, I know a few of you are, but it, it helps me. Okay. So. We're looking at a few covers of magazines, which most likely have been photoshopped. It's very hard today to see a picture, anything, whether it's an advertisement, commercial on TV, everything is edited and photoshopped and not really the way that it's originally supposed to be. And with computers getting more advanced and better and better, the Photoshop gets even better. So here is another example. We see the, the two faces, um, how photoshopping really enhances images. Now, what does photoshopping have to do with the topic of the class? Well, I want to tell you about, I'd say maybe the earliest photoshop in history in 1898. Now, that's before there were computers and before there was even photoshop. So what did they use to photoshop? Um, they'd use scissors and glue. Now, what is this photoshop that was done? Why is it so crucial? So I'd like to show you a picture of that. You guys are looking at a picture of Theodore Herzl. Now, Herzl has, it, the ironic thing about him is the, the, the longer he's dead, the more famous he, he becomes. And just to throw out sentences that people say about him, he's the father of modern Zionism. He founded the state of Israel, all kinds of things that people say. Um, I'm not gonna say any of it yet. I, we'll, we'll, we'll learn about him, we'll see. But this is a picture of Herzl meeting a man named Kaiser Wilhelm II, who is the emperor of Germany. and. The, his meeting is documented, except for the fact that this historical picture, this is a historical picture that never was. This picture is photoshopped. Now, I, I'm, I, for, if someone has really sharp eyes and is able to take account of shadow and things like that, you could, there's ways to tell that it's photoshopped, but I wanna show you what the original picture is and then explain why they found this so necessary to do. This is the original picture. Over here on the first horse is the emperor. And right here in red in circle, we see the horse's feet and Herzl's feet. He, the, uh, this meeting took place in Israel. And to get to Israel at that time is very hard. You have to go by ships and on donkeys. And Herzl made tremendous efforts to get to Israel. This is in 1898 because he knew it was very important for me to meet, to meet with the leader of Germany. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit later on. And he had a friend, and his friend had one job, to take a picture of the meeting. And, and this is what resulted. Now, more important than the meeting itself, and according to researchers, in the actual meeting, they spoke about the weather because it was hot, um, was the picture to prove that it happened. And we know today, if there's no picture, it didn't happen. And, and he messed it up, the guy taking the picture. So I want to show you, so how was it fixed? Um, the Kaiser was moved the horse back, and Herzl was moved closer. This picture of Herzl, he's holding a white hat on a roof in Jaffa. And this is the resulting picture proving that the, the meeting took place. Now, one of the things that I want to answer um, for, the net, for the time that we have together is how does this photograph and Photoshop efforts represent Herzl's entire philosophy and ideas about the Jewish state? So I'd like to, I, on my to-do list was always to research about Herzl because I've been to the Herzl Museum a few times and you always hear about him, Herzl, 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 and everything's named after him. Like, who is he? What did he do? Why is he so important? And I'm blown away by what I learned. I read a part of this book. It's called Chamesh Davot Tzionut. That's where 99% of the information um, comes from that you are about to hear. Okay. Other than answering that question, there's a few other points that I want to cover. One is that the idea of the Jewish state has existed for thousands of years. So what was Herzl's big innovation? <laughs> Everyone knows that it's just for the Jewish people and we want it. So that's one point I'm also gonna address. 
Another one is what are his two core principles for the Jewish state? If we have to summarize all of his beliefs in two sentences, what does he believe? And the last thing is what is his most famous line? Some of you might already know his line and how is that relevant to our lives today? And that's my favorite part about it because after I read uh, a lot about Herzl, I was all, wow, everyone needs to know this. It's so exciting. I was so excited to learn and I'm so excited to share it with you. So let's go back to our sources. The first time we see Eretz Yisrael mentioned, Hashem tells Abraham, this land is going to be for you and your children. And if we fast forward along in Jewish history, we have, uh, this is one of, on Pesach we have Arba Lashonot Ke'ula, and the last one is Behaveti. Hashem is, is telling the Jewish people, I'm going to bring you to the land that I promised Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. Continuing along, Yoshua. Yoshua comes into Eretz Yisrael, Hashem says, Kol makom asher tidroch kafrag lechem ba, lechem netativ. Anywhere you step, I am giving you. And we know, opening the Torah and opening the Nevi'im, that Eretz Yisrael belongs to us. And throughout the centuries, the Jewish people always wanted to be in the land of Israel. For centuries, they're dreaming about it. We could open up the Tehillim book. Veshuv Hashem et shivat siyon hainu kachomim. We're always chomim, we're always dreaming about it. So it was not new that Theodore Herzl's association with Israel, and we're going to clarify what exactly it was, and him founding the status, people say, it's not new, because we always wanted Israel. So what is so unique about him? That's what we're going to see what that is. Now, the plan to move into... One second, I have to close another place. Sorry, I'm having a technical... Shut this. Always. Wait, sorry. Okay, I'm stopping the share for a second because I need to X something. Okay, now I can do it again. Okay. So the popular model to settle Eretz Israel, what it's been for centuries, uh, up until Herzl's time, and here's already here's where his uniqueness is starting, is let's slowly make Aliyah. Person by person will move to Israel. Every person that moves means more land, another house, more families. And slowly, slowly it leads to millions of Jewish people and then we're the majority. And this has been the plan forever. This is how we are going to come back to Israel. And it makes a lot of sense because the Jews, it's one thing to that Israel is ours, but if nobody lives there, no one lives there. And you actually need to live in the, in the land. And that was the model, except it didn't really work. And Herzl, he pointed out two major flaws with this theory. Now, while Herzl was alive, there were many, many people that were against him because they said the way to get to Edith Israel is this way. And the way Herzl called it, he said it was infiltration, which the, the people pro pro proponing um, this idea was a group known as Chavavet Zion and even rabbis before that. And they said, we need to do it slowly. And we don't want anyone to know what our plan is. We want all of a sudden there to be millions of Jews, but we can't let people know. Now, what did Herzl point out doesn't really work with this plan? Do you know in history of any group mass migrations where nobody noticed, especially the Jewish people, everyone knows everything about them. When people move from one area to another, one, they're taking their resources with them, they're taking their businesses, there's less people, and then they're moving to a different country and they're building houses and infrastructure and businesses. Of course, people's gonna know, people are going to notice, and of course, because of the Jewish people. People always notice the Jewish people, and it's no secret that it's been a Jewish dream for years to live in Israel. So the, the plan of the Jews secretly doing it and no one catching on is not really gonna work. So he didn't like that idea, and he had another idea, which was, this is really very unique to him. And part of the reason why he is so famous he didn't like this idea. His plan had two parts, and now we're answering the second part. One, he said, what we need in order to get Eretz Yisrael and it to be ours is we need autonomy in, with, and here's the key, world recognition. We need all the countries of the world to recognize that Israel is ours. And what Herzl's huge mission in life that he took upon himself was, I need to convince the world that the solution to the problem of the Jews and to Israel is that we need it. And if we look at world history, what's going on in Europe at that time, there's tons of anti-Semitism going on. And I'm not going to um, 
in this Zoom, I'm not going to be talking about Herzl's life and his family and things about his personality. Uh, maybe I'll do Herzl part two next week. But he lived in Europe and there was tons of anti-Semitism. And, and the world was aware of that too. And he said the so only solution is we need to be in Israel and we need the world to recognize it. Now, this is the exact opposite of what everyone else's plan is because everyone else's plan is let's do it secretly so no one will know. And Herzl says, what do you mean? We need everyone to know. We want world attention. That's, that is what is going to help us. Okay. And his second key point was that we need our own army. If it's great that the world recognizes us and we're in Israel and we're ruling ourselves, but if we don't have our own army, we have nothing. And he constantly, constantly cited these two points. And he said, you can't have one without the other. And he was well aware of the, the problems that already exist in Israel. And he knew that the people there wouldn't be happy because since when are people usually happy when they get no immigrants? Except I would say uh, the Jewish people are happy when more people make oh yeah, we're thrilled about that. But the other population, they're never happy about it. So he said, we need our own army to defend ourselves. These are the two key things that we need. And he was very, very strong on these points. Now, it was, okay, sorry. I'm pausing the share for a minute. Oh. Sorry, I'm having so many technical, okay. Wait, doing it again. Okay. To convince the world that the Jewish people need Israel, it's a very difficult test. And that they should give it to us is very difficult. And one of the things we're going to talk about a little bit later is that Herzl was very upfront with what he wanted. He wasn't beating around the bush. Maybe I think it'll be a good idea. Straight out, we demand the land of Israel. He's demanding it. He's not asking, hopefully you'll, you'll give it to me. And that was also something that was very unique about him. He was clear about his intentions. And no one would, no one really wanted to attempt to, okay, now let's convince the world that Israel should belong to the Jews. Ooh, that's practically impossible. However, for a man like Herzl and a lot of leaders, the, a lot of driven people, the harder the challenge, it gets his blood running, the more he wants to do it. And Herzl knew that some, that they did not have all the time that the rest of the world wanted to wait because this plan of slowly infiltrating Israel, it takes a long time. You slowly, slowly go, but Herzl knew that they didn't have that. Anti-Semitism is on the rise. The Jews need, need a solution now. They can't wait. Plus, another great point he made, he said, if someone's a visionary looking to the future, the most you could look is a few decades. You can't look hundreds of years in advance. So he said, if we're making a change, we need to do it now. He said, Israel is not going to be something that's slowly coming. There's going to be a change immediately. And there's a really great analogy that I'm not sure if he gave it or the book that I read gave it, but either way, I'm going to share it. That picture, you have a person, uh, you have an enemy, and he's trying to drown someone, and he's holding his head under the water for an hour. Now, the person that's, that's almost drowning is, has a very, very strong tolerance of pain and suffering. So he's not drowning yet because he could tolerate it. And then the enemy decides that I'm getting tired of drowning this person. So let me get, let the person just rest for an hour because I need my hands need a break from holding him down. And he said, that's the critical point that we are at now. We have an hour. Wow. What are you going to do with the hour? Is the person that was drowning going to sit and breathe and enjoy the air? Or are you going to realize my enemy is coming back and he can do something quick? And that's how Herzl saw it. He said, right now we have an opportunity. We can't sit and wait for things to get worse. And he predicted, he's, and he, he's before the Holocaust. He said something really, really bad is gonna happen. I feel it coming. Not that he's predicting the Holocaust, but he's looking at world history and knows that Jewish people aren't safe. And he said, we can't wait. We need to, right now, we need to make a change. And some of the, I'm sorry I keep pausing. Every time I click on something, it keeps putting something on my screen and it makes it hard for me to see. Let me try one more time and then I'm just gonna deal with it. A minute. Thank you all for being so patient. I think that's something we really learned during this uh, period about how patient and flexible we need to be. I don't know why it keeps doing that. Let me try this again because this worked for me. Okay. So consistency, stubbornness, faith, 
persuasion and a dynamic personality that ran everybody over, won everyone over. Those are some of the traits of Theodor Herzl, which made him an ideal person to do this. Now, he elected to do it on himself. And he started only the last few years of his life. He died in 1904, they say from a heart attack and just from uh, stress of <laughs> what he was doing. And the, the, we're gonna see the first big event that he had was in 1897. So that's seven years of work. That's really not a lot. And his whole, he wasn't working on it in his whole life, but he had the traits to make it happen. And I wanna take a, a step back and talk about what was going on on the world map at the time, and what did Herzl see? So Israel was under the control of Turkey, and Herzl said it's only a matter of time until the, the Ottoman Empire falls, until Turkey falls, and Israel's gonna be up for grabs again. And he said, we need to make sure that when Israel's up for grabs, it's gonna be given to us. Because otherwise, if we look at thousands of years of Jewish history and follow all the time periods, Israel's just being passed around from one, one ruling group to another. He said, the past needs to stop. We need to make a change now. And he had a bunch of plans too. He said, if this doesn't work, I'll do something else. Now I'm just going to mention um, the, her, something Herzl is known for, and there's a lot of opposition for this, is that at a point he said, you know what, it's the war to get Israel. Let's bring the Jewish people to Uganda. And he was met with tremendous opposition. What do you mean? You can't bring them to Uganda. We need Ed to sit out. Now, something that a lot of people don't know is when he had this whole Uganda plan, so we had a whole charter written up for how it's gonna work. It was under the British Empire and it's gonna be given to, to the Jewish people. When the Balfour Declaration in 1917 came out, which was the, the British people saying that we are in favor of the Jewish state being created, given Israel for the Jewish people, a lot of the people on that committee were people that were on the Uganda committee and they saw the language and how it was being written out. So Herzl really, really set the stage for what was going to happen. And then after World War I, when, when Israel is up for grabs, and it was, then the British were given a mandate on it, it was because of the work that Herzl did before. And that's why he said, I need to sit and meet with every diplomat, every statesperson that I could, because I'm putting in the foundation, even if I'm doing nothing. And we're going to talk in a minute about what did he actually do, because like, there's nothing concrete we could really say. So we're going to talk about that in a minute. In 1897, a group met known as the World Zionist Congress. And Herzl, the reason why he wanted this created is he said, if we are telling the world that we are ready to have a state of our own, then we need to be ready for it too. And he wanted to get the people used to the idea that we're going to have a governing body, we're going to have the Jews united. And the people that were against him said, this is a horrible idea, we can't bring attention to the Jews. And I really... I'm thinking about it now, just this point of Herzl wanting to show the world who he is and who the Jewish people are. I really love that because why should we be embarrassed? Why should we hide? First of all, we can't hide because the more the Jews try to hide, the more the outside world notices us. And he was proud. He said, let's organize. We, we need the infrastructure because we're going to eventually be ruling ourselves. Let's start now. And a very, very famous sentence that he said in Basel, which is Switzerland, he says, in Basel, I founded the Jewish state. If I said this out loud, today, out loud today, I would be greeted by universal laughter. In five years, perhaps, and certainly in 50 years, everyone will perceive it. And he was spot on because 50 years later, the Jewish state was founded. So he knew, he said, I'm doing the legwork now, but I know, I know that the state is going to be created. And of all the things we were speaking about, that you need autonomy and world recognition, and you need your own army, and you need to rule yourselves, this is all very important and key components in what Herzl said, and he constantly repeated these things over and over and over. However, by far, what Herzl wrote and believed and said over and over and over, the most important ingredient in all of this and in getting all of this and all of this happening is, that son, is will. You need to want it. You need to will it to happen. And that, and this, it's, Interesting, because this is emotional, it's an emotional piece. It's not money, it's not we need tons of money. It's not we need to live in a lot of, in, build a lot of houses. You need the will, you need to want it to happen. Because if you don't want it to happen, there's no, no effort anyone could do to make it happen. And uh, another line, he says, The only people that can save the Jewish people are themselves. If he won't save himself, there's no salvation for him. And he spoke at length about the need for the Jewish people to will 
the state of Israel and to want it to be a reality. And I think even today, um, we really need to ask ourselves, how much do we want it? <laughs> we, and everyone could take that sentence and fill in the blank about the, the, in their life, how connected to Israel, just in general, how much you really want something. Because he said, if you don't have this, you have nothing. And for that reason, his most famous line was, Im tirtsu enzo agada. If you will it, it's not a legend. It will happen if you want it enough. And every opportunity that he had, Herzl let the people know. He let the Jewish people know. You're not a downtrodden nation with no self-esteem that's beaten up. And that's how they looked at themselves. They're in Europe, they're not rich. They, they, I mean, some of them were, but they looked at themselves as with no self-esteem. And, and you, this, you, the people of Israel that's suffering and trying to hide, and that's, that's what the people are saying outright. Let's not make too much noise, let's hide. You now think you're going to go and rule yourselves and be autonomous in the state of Israel? You need to believe it. And he kept letting the people know over and over and over, Am Yisrael hu chazak ve kabir. Am Yisrael is strong and mighty. And the word kabir, we have um, in uh, the, the tefillon in the holidays, I'm forgetting the exact line, but it comes up a lot, that word. Also, there's a, there's a really great pizmon called Ata El Kabir. So Kabir is strong. And know that you're strong. And if, if we took this right now and we told it to the Jewish people and said, Jewish people, you are strong, you are mighty, I wonder how many people believe it. I know I, know, I would imagine that the fact that we have the army definitely gives some belief to it. But like we said, that's not enough. You have to believe with your whole heart and soul that you are the one that dictates your future. And you need to demand it. You can't just ask. And that was very, very key for Herzl, the belief in knowing that you're strong. And this I mentioned, but I want to say it again, because this, a lot of people think that money is the answer. If we just give the state of Israel billions of dollars, then they'll have more money for their army. They'll have more money for everything. Let's keep donating, donating, donating. Continue donating. It's amazing to give money to, this, to, the, to the state of Israel, to the country, to the Jewish people, to people that need it. However, that is not what's going to solve it because more important is the emotional health of the nation and what they believe about themselves. And it wasn't by buying land or building houses that we get to settle the land, only by an internal change in the makeup of the nation's psyche. So that it's not something that you're going to physically feel. You can't point to it and say that's it. But it, the whole nation of Israel needs to undergo a change in what they believe about themselves in order for us to win. And this right here, I have written in red, Gibor Ani. On a personal note, um, if you speak to your children and you tell your children you want, you believe in yourselves and you could do it. And we know that if we want to accomplish something, the most basic step is we need to believe that we could do it. Because if you're telling yourself, our self-talk is so powerful. If we're telling ourselves, I can, it's not going to happen, I don't know and give them all the reasons why not, it's not gonna happen. So the first thing on an individual level, you tell yourself, Gibor Ani, I'm strong. And he said, the second the nation says, Gibor Ani, I am strong, is a game changer. No one can stop. <laughs> I get so excited by talking about this. No one can stop the nation of Israel the second they know who they are and they, they, they look at the world straight on and say, this is what we demand. And Herzl was so upfront, I demand this. I'm not asking, this is what we need. And I think, um, it would be amazing if the country of Israel, the people of Israel would stand up and say, this is who we are, this is who we're presenting to the world, and this is what we demand, we are strong, we are God's nation, because it is 100% true on an individual level and on a national level. But, but, with all this and with all my excitement, belief in yourself is still not enough, and I think I already started uh, touching on the next piece that you need, but I'm going to say here, organized. You need to dare. You could believe in yourself. You could think you're the best and strong and powerful. But if you don't dare to make a change, if you don't dare to do it, if you don't take a risk, it's not going to happen. And that is something that Herzl said too. He said, okay, it's probably, it, it's my chances of convincing the world that Israel is for the Jewish people are not great. Step one, I believe it. Now I'm going to dare to try, dare to make a difference, dare to go thousands of miles to meet with the Kaiser. I talk about the weather, I have someone snap the photo, I need to Photoshop it because I need to, I need to just put my will out into the world and do it. And he found that Omitz Mamlachti, a 
national daring and bravery was what was missing among the Jewish people. He said, when the Jewish people has the, has the belief and when they're able to dare, then that's when we're gonna get what we need. And a very, if we had to summarize what Herzl believed in three words, be believe, dare, and will. You need to will it, you need to want it to be, you need to believe in yourselves and you need to dare. And if you have these three ingredients, you could achieve it. And these were the ingredients he said about the state of Israel and getting the country. And I think these three ingredients on a personal level in your life, everyone can take it, which is why I love learning about um, him or just uh, people's lives because the principles are so, so relevant and current. It might not be exactly, it's not, that might not be, it's not the same conditions, but the ideas behind it are really, really very current. And I want to ask, what did he actually do? So we opened up with the picture of him. I said, this is a very critical meeting. More important than the meeting itself is that we get a picture to show that it happened. And if we look at what Hartford did, physical concrete actions that you could point to and say, this happened, he didn't really do much. It was, we said that it wasn't many years of his life and he was active. It was a lot of meetings. Now think about in your life, <laughs> how many Zoom meetings do you have in, in, in business? How many business meetings do you have? I know I was a teacher and I would have teacher meetings. And oftentimes at the end of meetings, you say, what was the point of that meeting? We could have done it in five minutes of an email. The meeting did nothing. Why do we do the meeting? And that's a lot of times how people feel. Now, if we talk about this specific meeting, what did the meeting actually do? I don't know if it actually did something, however, what it does in the national memory, the meeting of Herzl with Germany and the meeting with England and the meeting with, with every other country, all of a sudden, now when you have 1917, the Balfour Declaration and England is, 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 is proposing the favorable idea of the creation of a state, what do all these people already know? Why is this not brand new to them? Because Herzl put the groundwork and he was the one that, that put the ideas into the head. And he said, I, I know I believe that once I put the foundation in, the physical concrete actions, the war and whatever needs to happen will happen, but I need to do my part and do this. And without a doubt, what he did had an effect because all we need to do is just open the history books and see. And I, I, I mentioned as a side note, and maybe in a future class I could expand on it, the people involved in the Balfour Declaration were very involved with Herzl. They knew who he was, they knew his ideas. So a lot of times, you might not see the concrete physical thing that you could point to, but the meeting itself has value in the fact that you gather them together and that this idea is important to you because it all starts from your thoughts. Now, I want to um, summarize what we spoke about and then I just want to end with one more thing. We, uh, today, we opened up with a photoshopped picture of Herzl and we spoke about the idea of a Jewish state, how it was something that the Jews for centuries, we open up the Torah, the Tanakh, we see that it's there. So Herzl was not unique in proposing, hey, let's give the state of Jews for the Jewish people, but he was unique in his approach because the approach up until his time was the infiltration method. Let's slowly, quietly make Aliyah and then eventually we'll have more people and more people and more people. Now Aliyah is amazing. We should be living in the land of Israel, but to be quiet about it, Herzl didn't agree. So let's make a splash, let's make noise because anyway, you can't really do it quietly. How could you make Aliyah quietly? It doesn't work. And he proposed autonomy and world recognition. He said, the world needs to know we're here and recognize the state of Israel. That's what's going to make the difference. And his second part, no less important, which he always said, was the Jewish army. That we need an army to protect ourselves. And we see today how much we do. And he knew it was a, a difficult task. Most people were not even willing to approach it because of how difficult it was. And, there, and he also knew we can't sit and wait for centuries for the Jews slowly to move. This anti-Semitism, this pressure, we need, and we can also see so far into the future, we need now to make a difference. And some of his traits of him being stubborn and persuasive and his dynamic personality helped win over the, the leaders that he met with to at least know who the Jewish people are and say, okay, it might be a good idea. Then we spoke about the world map, how Herzl was aware of what was going on and he knew it would only be a matter of time until the Ottoman Empire fell and Israel was up for grabs. And he said, this time, I don't want it to be up for grabs. I don't want it to fall into another empire. I want it to be given to the Jewish people. And in fact, after World War I, when 
the Ottoman Empire was dismantled, it was. We mentioned the World Zionist Congress, which Herzl founded and was so proud of because he says the Jewish people need to know that they are going to govern themselves and it's going to be a governing body. And we read the quote where he said, I founded the Jewish state. How amazing that he could say that and know it. If only he could, he could be alive to see it happen. And then we concluded with the, of everything we said, the most important ideas were that Herzl said, you need the Ratzon, you need the will to want it. You need to believe, Giborani, I am strong, and you need Omitz Mamachti, the nation needs to daring. And he said, we summarized everything he said, believe, dare, will it, and you can get what you want. And the last thing I want to just conclude with is just some food for thought, because I, we're learning about him. Okay, now what? What do we do with, what do we do with this? So one, this is a question I'm asking you, and I'm also asking myself. Do you live in a gibor ani mentality in your own life? Are you telling yourself constantly how great you are, how powerful you are, how amazing you are? Or are you telling yourself, you're not so smart, why did you do that, you're stupid, you're lazy, whatever, whatever we tell ourselves, <laughs> because we're very good at talking down to ourselves. And think about all of a sudden when you say, I am strong, I am powerful, what's open? So that's one, I, I'm gonna ask myself, if that's how I live my life. Two, what about your children? Do you teach your children to live that way? Are your children uh, viewing the world, meeting the world, saying, I am strong, I am powerful, I can do every, anything, or do they not? And if it's not a way they live, how can we teach our children to live that way? Live that way. And the last thing is, where in your life do you need to put more of your, that's on more of your will forth? Because that, his famous line, Im Tirtsu, and Im Tirtsu, and the Agada said, you need to will it first, you need to want it. In our own lives, do we will things? Do we want them? Do we put it out into the world or do we keep it quiet and embarrassed and not want people to know? Because that's a huge, huge, huge step and part about it. And we're going to end with his line, Im Tirtsu and the Agada, I believe this with my whole heart and soul. If you will it, if you want something enough, it's not a legend, it can happen. Thank you very much for being here. This was very exciting for me to talk about Herzl. And I hope you all enjoyed. And I can't wait to see you next week. Uh, it might be part two about him because there's so much more to say about him or it might be about someone else new or about a different place. Stay tuned. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. That was very informative. Thank you very much. You're welcome.